So, um, welcome everyone to uh, the Simon East Midlands branch, stroke West Midlands branch, Rivers and Coastal Group, and also in association with ICE, ICE East and West Midlands. That's a bit of a mouthful to start with. Um, so, welcome to um, this uh, webinar um, about the Burton flood risk strategy, um, stakeholders and challenges and opportunities. Um, I'll hand over to Will Grove shortly, but a few uh, things I'd like to say uh, beforehand before we before we go into the uh, presentation. Um, uh, please use the Q and A uh, facility uh, to put your questions into the speakers, uh, and the speakers have asked if we can take those questions at the end of the presentation, um, and that that would be the best way forward for for us all. Um, if you experience any technical issues and need any assistance, please use the chat feature on Zoom to let us know what the problem is and what help is required. So um, just some general housekeeping. Um, the webinar event, so this webinar event will be recorded. Um, we only put recordings of our events up on the Simon website, YouTube, uh, when the authors and speakers give us permission to do so, and as long as there are no copyright issues. Um, there are ver various other past digital series that you can uh, look at on, on YouTube um, at your own leisure. Please keep yourselves on mute. Um, that would be, be really helpful, uh, just, just to reduce the background noise. Uh, and as I said, if there's any technical issues, just uh, put those in the chat. Um, there is um, an hour and a half uh, CPD uh, attributable, to, attributable to this webinar, um, but uh, SIWEM don't provide any CPD certificates. Um, so um, just thought I'd um, say as well that SIWEM has switched to uh, the virtual world, reaching out to a global audience, providing relevant and accessible events to our community working in the water and environment sector connecting the local national and international through our digital series um, there's uh, just just another point to make about cyber um, the um, on the climate and ecological emergency declaration so siren made a, a declaration at the end of 2019 and will be holding events and activities that address the issues arising from the declaration. Um, there's some key dates in the chat, which Barbara has, has put in there. Uh, so the Climate Emergency COP in Glasgow in November and the Biodiversity COP in, uh, in China. So for information about um, SIWEM upcoming events, including those hosted by branches and groups, please go to the SIWEM events page. Um, on the website um, and there's some uh, events coming up dates for the diary so Wednesday the 3rd of uh, February 2021 there's a flood and coast session three the new era of digital innovation in FCERM that's £25 that one and there's an introduction and welcome from Terry Fuller uh, Monday the 22nd of February there's an adaption reporting best practice uh, webinar part of the Simon Climate Emergency Adap Adaptation Net Zero Digital Series. Um, also in on the 14th of April is another flood and coast uh, session, session four, broadening innovative investment in FSERM. Um, and there's also some uh, various awards and other things on, on all on the Simon website. Uh, so that's I hope that's all useful for you. So just to remind you, if you have Q &A questions, uh, just drop them in the Q and A, and I will um, I will ask them to uh, the speakers at the end of their presentations. So um, without further ado, um, if Will you are ready, if you want to give me a nod, yeah, great, okay, ready. I'll hand, hand over to Will. He will uh, now uh, take over. Thank you, James, and good evening, everybody. Uh, just to confirm that the purpose of the presentation then is we're, we're going to run you through Burton upon Trent Flood Risk Management Scheme, which has been uh, the renewal of part of the, the flood defences that protect Burton from the River Trent. Uh, we'll do that in the context of uh, the stakeholders we've been dealing with. 
just as a quick intro from myself, uh, Will Groves, I'm the Senior Flood Risk Advisor at the Environment Agency and I work out of the Litchfield office. Um, I'm a senior user on this scheme, I'm one of two. Uh, my role is to represent the views of external partners so that we can build the scheme with their views taken into account. Um, my sort of, uh, track record is I've spent 20 years at the Environment Agency. Um, my role's been focused around, uh, largely around the environment program side of, of the business, uh, focusing on delivering projects and working with partners and getting external funding in. So I've worked on national lottery funded projects and river restoration schemes in urban areas, but more recently on flood risk projects like uh, Roosley Flood Risk Management Scheme and the last three or four years have been focused on this scheme. Uh, over to you, Danny. Hello, hi. Uh, hi everyone, I'm um, Danny Hayden, the project manager for this project. I've been with the Environment Agency for 11 years and in that time I've worked within the Flood and Coastal Risk Management Programming Team, working on their um, annual bids and their annual programmes across the region. Um, I've also worked in the National Programme Office and more recently I've moved into um, the um, program and contract management team and I've been a project manager on the Lempster flood scheme and uh, various modelling projects around the country. Um, I'll just begin the presentation so Will do you mind just changing slides please? There you go. So um, now I'll just give you a bit of history um, and background information about uh, flooding in Burton and the development of its uh, the town's defences. So Burton is a town that's expanded and been developed alongside the River Trent, utilising um, its groundwater and the connectivity to the river to, well, mainly develop its really quite famous brewery industry. Um, however, the issue with that is um, it comes at being significant flood risk um, there are flood defences along the entire length of the town on their left bank of the Trent. And this project has been focused on upgrading uh, 3.7 kilometres of the defences. Um, due to most of the defences being located in quite constrained and populated areas as the town's developed around them, um, as part of this project, uh, our remit was to ensure that the new defences stayed within the existing footprint of the existing defences. So if you just see in the, um, the pictures there of the cross sections of uh, some of the typical cross sections of the defences we've got throughout the scheme, it's within the existing footprint. Um, if I just go on to the next slide, I'll give you some context about the, the project. So Burton has a long history of flooding, with the worst um, effects being recorded in the 1930s and 40s. And following significant flooding during this time, the town raised um, any existing defences and constructed several kilometres of new walls and embankments. So the scheme that we're working on currently is um, part of the Environment Agency's six-year um, programme that concludes on the 5th, 31st of March. And this scheme will improve uh, flood protection to over 4,500 homes and over a thousand businesses. Um, the phases of the upgrade, so this is known as phase two uh, of the Burton um, flood risk management scheme. So in 2004 the uh, fluvial trend strategy was produced and that recommended that the existing form of the defences, so basically embankments and walls, are an appropriate method of flood defence. And in parallel to this, a pre-visibility report was uh, produced reviewing the condition of these defences. It was identified that there were certain areas that needed urgent, urgent works. And um, that's why Burton phase one was promoted on, on, on these recommendations. Um, but due to a need of uh, basically a restriction in cash in 2006, 2007, Many of the proposed works were actually descoped, and only the most urgent works were delivered during that phase one. Um, it meant that many structures were improved to extend their life rather than being replaced. 
and it's recognised that further works would be required in 2017, which is where phase two comes into play. Um, and as part of this project, this is why we're now investing in these assets uh, to, to pick up those assets that weren't captured in phase one. Um, so costs, risks and timescales. So at the moment, we're looking at outturning for the main scheme uh, at 25.2 million. With, that includes a contribution of three million pounds from the local enterprise partnership uh, funding scheme, and we've got a strict delivery date to deliver our the ho homes protected, also known as outcome measures, by February 2021. So we're very busy at the minute. Um, it's been delivered through a design and build contract with our suppliers, uh, Gallifrey Chai and Black and Beach, which is joint venture, and. Um, in terms of risks, so the risk that the project has sort of identified and had to work with is um, the air, the, the flood defences that we're working on on a continuous length of flood defence, they're splitting to into, into 19 individual areas. So uh, in terms of programming, because it's a design and build programme, we've had to sort of concurrently run design, um, the design progressive assurance process alongside bringing construction online and um, aligning them all to get to our end date of February. Uh, it has meant though that the programme has been very adaptive to any delays that we've seen on certain sections so we can switch and change so it's, it's been quite efficient in that manner. Um, the other risks are network rail which I'll talk about uh, in, a, in, a, in a little while. Weather and flooding, again, I'll cover that in a few slides, and um, confined working just because of the sheer lack of space in some locations, buried services, which is probably a given for most projects, uh, construction projects, and stakeholders, which um, myself and Will will cover as well in this presentation. Um, the delivery of this project has been a very uh, collaborative approach with our suppliers, um, Gallifrey, Tri and Black and Beach. Um, the A team, we were co-located to GBV in the, in the site offices and um, one example of this collaboration of how it's been, it's worked quite well is having a progressive design assurance process. So the wider environment agency team, um, we saw designs at 30%, 80%, 100% and then accepted for construction and that's included bringing in um, members of the team such as the field team who will be maintaining and operating these assets once they're completed and what that's meant is that um, at the end of the design and build contract the end users so i.e the field team have got something that they can they can maintain and, it, and it's what they wanted okay uh, moving on then um <clears throat> as Danny said uh, stakeholders are a big part of this scheme uh, when you're renewing a, a flood defence in a, a large urban area, then inevitably you'll have landowners adjacent uh, to, to the uh, flood defences that take some management and other people with interest. So that our communication plan was something that we got produced very early. So that's split into four main stakeholder groups. There's those that uh, where we'd need permission. So that is something that largely our contractor would deal with. There's those people that uh, are impacted on by the scheme, so they're perhaps right next to it, and we'll show some examples soon. Uh, there's the beneficiaries, because of course we want to tell people that they're defended from the flood defences, believe it or not. A lot of people in Burton don't realise that there's a flood defence uh, because they stay dry. Uh, and then there's those we need to inform. So the kind of things we do uh, across the scheme is... Uh, and the principle really is to take people with us on the journey. So it's, a lot of this is about... Uh, early engagement so you're not dropping things on, on important stakeholders so in terms of the public we did three rounds of public drop-ins at various locations uh, and that were they were at strategic points so that was a uh, certain points in the design so we could like I say take people on the journey um, we did extensive landowner liaison um, I can't list all the, the stakeholders off the top of my head now but uh, a golf club a school a pub uh, a farmers residents there's a long list and you'll see those in a bit so um, for each section we've we've had monthly meetings weekly meetings where necessary to take people with us so we can take account of their views within the scheme and of course we want to promote the scheme and keep people up to date so we'd, we'd have newsletters and this would 
uh, normal press calls and social media that we use. Uh, then the next point um, is a bit, an approximation of the, the amount of stakeholder actions. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but the point I just want to make here is that a significant amount of stakeholder engagement, so about a thousand stakeholder actions at least, where someone in the agency is having to go to speak to someone else about the scheme. And the sort of set up the structure is uh, shown in that structure chart, whereby I work closely with Danny because the stakeholders are, they're a risk if we don't take account of their view. And then they ask us to, to do things uh, after we design the scheme, because that could affect our program. So it can affect time, it can affect cost. Um, so I work closely with Danny. And then uh, we have a public liaison officer who works with me and Danny. I have additional support. Uh, for liaison with those that are impacted on. We have our own estate team to do the uh, legal aspects, so serving notice of entry. Uh, and then our contractor also support, supported us, so they had their own public liaison officer, and uh, our contractor would also support us at, at meetings. And that uh, Danny was talking just about collaborative working, so although uh, we, we would lead, for example, on uh, communicating with those impacted on the on the, uh, by the scheme, uh, our contractor would come with us and support us where necessary. And likewise, uh, if our contractor was leading on permissions uh, and they were struggling, but we we knew people we could help out, we we would work together to sort that out. I think we're on to the next slide. So, Danny, I think you're doing this one. Yeah. So, thank you. So, this is the Bramwell Close section. So, um, the main. The main landowner in this uh, section is actually Network Rail. So if you can see on your um, the top left hand photo is uh, that shows what the defence looked like before we did any works. And obviously you can see a freight train in the picture as well. So that's the main line between Birmingham and Derby running there. So we've worked very closely with um, Network Rail's ASPRO team and we've worked under their um, APRA agreements and gone through their forms one, two and three processes. Um, and as a stakeholder, done a lot of engagement and a lot of work uh, with them to be able to get our construction methods put in, uh, i.e. using the piling uh, rigs to get the, that close to and have an adjacent line working. Um, what we've also done is if you look in the bottom, oh, actually in the top right hand photo as well, we've put in a palisade fence as well to improve security um, along the railway as well. So basically the flood defence there is a sheet pile defence with a capping beam. So it reduces the need um, for lots of uh, maintenance in that area. And that this, the, the network rail works um, and the management for stakeholder, they've been managed very well on this project. But it's basically because uh, GBV have got a, a, a defined resource um, who understands and works with network rail before. And that's, that's really paid dividends on this project. Um, the next section then I'm going to talk about is Warren Lane. This is probably one of the most straightforward sections of the project. So basically we just, um, that's the existing, that was the existing defence in the top left hand corner again there. Um, we wanted to make the embankment more stable stable by putting a, basically putting a sheet pile through the middle of it. Um, there weren't that many stakeholders involved in this and it's just basically about improving, improving the shape of the embankment to make it more maintainable and safe to maintain uh, by our field team. Um, and then I'll hand back over to Will's going to talk about Lansdowne Road. Okay, so the, these first three sections are less less interesting in terms of stakeholders because they're, they're reasonably straightforward, but we're just going basically in order from uh, upstream to downstream. So uh, you can see in the top left hand photo, you can see before. You can see the houses here. So this flood defence is actually people's back garden. So we, we maintain it, but we, we allow the, the landowners to, to mow the grass too, because they like to keep it neat and tidy. We wouldn't mow it as often as they would like it. We do it three or four times a year. Uh, you can see it's not changed a great deal. Um, I, I didn't put a complete after photo. I just wanted to show this one, the sheep pilings again, it's sheep piled. So it's probably just worth mentioning we sheep piled a lot of the defences because they were basically built from building waste from the, the brewery um, brewery demolitions uh, last century. So not the sort of thing you would build a defence of today. So that the sheep piles uh, give it the strength. So uh, 
moving on, getting more interesting now. So this is Paget High School. So in this section, so we were just up here, we're moving down now. Um, got a high school who've got a, a playing field that we've back onto and we're starting to move towards a golf course. So uh, for the high school, their key issue is there's a 400 metre track here. So we had to consider how we were going to build the flood defence so as not to take over the land uh, that this 400 metre track was on. Our asset team uh, initially wanted a, if you look at the bottom right photo, they wanted a, a nice white crest and nice uh, shallow uh, banks on both sides, easy to maintain for them. But obviously, as Dan has already said, when you're working uh, with stakeholders on the side, you've got to try and fit it into the footprint so as not to impact their land. So, um, so we built the, the flood defence. Uh, so it's got a sheet pile. If you look at the bottom right, there's a sheet pile on this side, and that faces uh, the school. And that's painted so it, it looks nice. And the key here, thing here was to program the work in so that they could use the, the 400 metre track. So we, did, we went to a lot of effort to make sure we were out of the way for the summer term last year and then COVID hit and the school wasn't there anyway. But at least we did actually achieve what we needed. Uh, on the side, on the other side, it, it was largely around the golf club and they had, they had a golf uh, tee for one of their holes on their championship course. It's a very uh, upmarket golf course. There's lots of competitions and we had some design the flood defence so as not to move a tee. When, you, when you're working with a golf course, if, if you think, okay, move a tee, that's easy. But actually that means move a tee, redesign a fairway, move a hole at the end. If you're moving the hole at the end, then you might be moving uh, the next hole and it's like a domino effect. So we, we, we had a golf course designer involved and I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. As we move up then we, uh, in the golf course car park, so at the centre of the golf course, um, we got sort of st stuck in the middle of a row. You can see uh, on either of these uh, photos, if you look at the top right, you've got some homes, and then you can see the car park for the golf course and the flood defence is in the middle. We promised people we would keep this hedge in place because they really didn't want that screen to come down. But lo and behold, even though we, we, we told our contractor not to take the hedge down, they took a large amount of it down, which caused us problems. Uh, they went to the papers and there's the, the uh, uh, headline. So there's lessons to be learned from us there, which we'll be discussing soon, I believe. Uh, but because we knew about the importance to the residents, we're putting this hoarding uh, that you can see here. We're going to replant a better hedge. And the final solution in the bottom right corner has a fence, which is actually closed board further up. So it really shuts off the golf ball. So they have got their privacy back. Um, and for interest, that black line here, well, black line is their concrete logo blocks, which was the temporary defence that we put in place here. It's funny because a lot of people thought that was the flood defence when we built it, and they're asking this question, is that the final product? It's clearly it's not. Again, here it's sheet piled. So bottom left-hand corner, you can see sheet piles there ready for installation. Um, still at the golf club, this is more about showing you the improvement to the defences. So. Uh, less about stakeholders, but um, if you look at the top left hand corner, that was the embankment. It's a really weak looking embankment. So this just sort of demonstrates uh, how much we've improved the flood defences. So we've gone from this poor looking thing to sheet pile, concrete and a nice brick uh, face wall. So the brick there matches uh, the homes here and the, the link to stakeholders here is that we didn't need planning permission for the scheme. But we made sure that we went through all the steps to make sure that we would tick the boxes the planners would want, such as uh, putting the correct finishes in place uh, and, and so on. Moving further up, we're still within the sort of confines of a golf course, but we had a, a, an allotment as well to deal with. So they're statutory allotments. Uh, allotments have quite a lot of power, so we had to do a lot of engagement for these people uh, to understand uh, their needs. Um, they had so much power in fact they could call us into the secretary of state if they didn't like what we were doing but it didn't come to that um the key thing here is where we interacted with the golf course you can see people here playing uh the tees and the greens were very close to the to the embankment so uh you can see down here there's this cone shape here and this basically shows you what would happen if you tee off so this is this is, this is one of the proposed new tees that we were going to move uh, around and basically if you if you hit your shot off that tee, 95% of balls would land in that shape. But before we moved it, that comb is over here. So that the area of works was within that comb, which showed that, uh, that that was bad for our work people. So 
we were going to move the golf course around and to cut a long story short that was going to be really expensive we we're talking about a quarter of a million to create three new tees and greens and then we knocked that on the head and agreed in the end with the golf course to close uh those three holes and we didn't know what we were doing really with this golf course because we're not golf course experts so a lesson learned there is we got an expert involved who uh a to design it and b who knew about the commercial side of golf courses who could help us make the right decision on whether to put temporary uh, facilities in or just close it which is what we did in the end and you can see again top left uh you can't see as well but this is quite a, a damaged flood defense got loads of dips in it and that's a, a good example of one that is hard to maintain but slopes aren't as shallow as it should be and then we've replaced it with this sheep par wall here and uh it slopes down as you can see on the bottom got a nice wide path as well for people to walk on with a, with a fence on top it looks quite tidy there uh, the next section, uh, we're going through these quite fast. I appreciate uh, there's, there's a chance for questions later. This is an example in terms of stakeholders. Uh, when, you, when you're doing this kind of work, you, you tend to get more questions and queries from more affluent people than less affluent people. Uh, there's about 400 people who back onto the defence here. And the, uh, the, the less uh, affluent didn't say a word here. They barely came to any of the drop-in sessions, just happy for us to get onto it. But there was a small section where we needed to uh, tie into a railway and we were planning to go down a private road uh, but the residents kicked, uh, they basically told us not to do that um, they didn't want us going up there they wanted us to go the long way around so we ended up doing that uh, in order to reduce the impact on them um, so uh, that's an example of where of where you know different types of people are likely to kick up a fuss one thing to note here is that that bottom left looks like it's nearly finished and that was late October 19 and the bottom right was late last year. You might be wondering what was the delay and it, it basically wasn't built as well as it could be so we, uh, in, in short made them do it again uh, such are the standards we have. Uh, basically the material on the bank was full of uh, foreign objects uh, sort of uh, terrams like a membrane and lots of uh, big, big rocks which wouldn't be good for us to maintain. Again, it's sheet piled all the way around. It's a big feature of the scheme is sheet piling through the original defences. Uh, sticking with Blackpool Street area, um, in terms of stakeholders, this cottage here, Watchman's Cottage, uh, this changed hands just as we were about to start building. So a young couple moved in, the lady was pregnant, and we announced we we're going to uh, do loads of construction work, and we've been there for about a year. Um, they were okay, but they weren't that easy to work with because you know, obviously we're trying to do a, a project, we're working to a, a programme, but yet they're, uh, you know, they weren't really conscious of that and they would do things like on that photo, park their car in our work area. Uh, they would uh, come back to us on questions late. So they delay us, uh, they complain about the works a lot because there was a lot of mud outside the house. Uh, but in the end, they did get something out of it. We got a new garage because when we built the flood defence down this narrow gap here, we weren't convinced that uh, original garage would stand up so they did benefit from it and we've moved out of that area more or less now uh, moving on the next section is quite a unique section it's just a, an area of light industry um, a good example of where you don't engage you get a bit of trouble we didn't think we would have to do much here in the first place and then it, it turned out we had to raise the wall so we ended up building a, a new wall we thought we would just top up the existing one but we built the new one so we we hadn't engaged much then we we, we come across covid uh therefore we were stuck at home while really we should have been out talking to these folks we did speak to this guy here who owns a, a company that provides uh products to the nhs but there was a development going on just to the side of this and it caused a few problems because we blocked the access uh but we just simply didn't know that development was there uh, but it all it, it went fine in the end but just an example of if you don't engage you, you can come across uh, a few problems uh just to look at the wall it's a reinforced wall there's the rebar shuttering ready to go in you can see on the bottom left there the reinforced concrete with the, the brick which is a matching brick again we don't need plan permission but we match the brick with the area and engage the planners just to be sure so we've got the right color brick in what is a conservation area Moving on then, this is probably the most uh, interesting area in terms of opportunities. So this is a library. So the next two sections are the library and leisure centre. This is where there are the most people in terms of public because there's open space here. Uh, there's a, a cafe people use, also a registry office in the library itself. Uh, so here, uh, 
we're doing quite a lot of additional work with the council. So about two years before we started, I went to see the council and said, if we're going to invest all this money, do you want anything out of it? More than just the flooded fences? Initially, they said no. Uh, a lesson out there was I spoke to the wrong person. And when I got the right person, they said yes. Uh, a bit more complicated than that, but they basically said, because this is near the town centre, what we'd like to do is improve this whole area to get more people to visit Burton. So wanted to create another reason for visiting Burton. So we did that by, uh, we, we, we produced a landscape vision for the whole of the washlands in Burton. And then we focused on this particular area, which is uh, out with so far outline designed, uh, hard and soft landscaping features and we've delivered some of those as part of the scheme so this bottom left photo shows uh, a high spec granite finish you can't really see it on the top one I haven't got a very good before photo but it's like a terracotta uh, block pose it's not very nice and you can see here we've uh, changed the, some of the lighting columns and the and the paths and there's more to do but that's something the council will do um, and Danny already said about we got some money from the local enterprise partnership to deliver the work. So that's another three million. So it was another business case we submitted. And then that, that money is paid for the scheme and will also pay for the additional soft landscaping works, hopefully this year. And the additional hard landscaping works. So as you go to the next slide again, uh, you can see the hard landscaping that we're doing as part of the flood defence or have done rather. So that adds value to the area. That, that soft landscape is going to carry out, be carried out on here, and I'll come on to it again in a bit. You can see it's a much better wall, much better finish. Believe it or not, that footpath is wider than that one at the top. You, you'd probably think I'm lying by the look of it, but that's three meters at the bottom, and it means it's more usable for multiple users. Um, although stakeholder wise in this area, very importantly, if you look at the top right, you can see that water tower. That is, it's an old water tower that signifies that this area here was. Uh, where a lot of the brewers were in Burton. This office here is Molson Coors office, so it's, it's really just one or two breweries left, but Molson Coors are the fifth biggest brewer in the world. And uh, they brew one and a half billion pints of carling every year. And 80% of their water supply comes under our flood defense. So we had to do some serious engagement with them to get them to approve uh, the design around that has sort of been very unpopular with most of uh, the beer drinkers of Britain. Um, it's an example where we, it was difficult to get hold of them because they weren't answering calls because they have a call centre and you, you couldn't speak to the managers, but because we had good relations with the council, we got in that way. And I think GBV really struggled to get to get contact, but once we did, I helped them out and, and we got uh, approval in the end for the design, which is what we needed. Interestingly, we didn't. Once it was built, we, we we lost contact. So we we asked them to just check that everything was built right. But I think because of COVID, it was it was almost impossible. Um, next slide is over to Danny. I think Don Amot. From mm. mute, Danny. There's always going to be one. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is a Don Amot uh, mobile home site. So this is probably one of the most constrained areas um, of the whole scheme because obviously it's just so, if you've seen that picture, it's so close to the River Trent um, and the embankment's really quite steep in this location. So it's hard to get any equipment down uh, in there to put the defences in. So um, GBB utilised this geek and uh, super crush silent piling technique so you can see in the picture it's like a train that sits on top of the pile and then as it goes it, it's sort of vibrationless piling process so it uses um a, a rock auger head that's um housed inside a casing that penetrates the, the hard ground and then the piles are pressed in um, and while they're being pressed in um the auger is then extracted and it's it was really good in this location because we had to get the piles to eight and a half meters um and it was one of the major successes of the scheme really because um because you're so close to these uh mobile homes and also the concrete slabs that they're based on this type of technology really made it achievable to to get the defense in what also uh was really beneficial to use this was obviously during the time that these works was going on was in the middle of the the summer lockdown and 
if we'd have, have gone down more traditional routes of um, putting a crane and a pine and rig on, you know, on the in the side the mobile home park, we'd have to move the mobile homes, we'd have to move the residents out during COVID, and they're quite they're quite a vulnerable community. So it just would have meant uh, huge delays and huge cost to the project. So it's been a real success uh, in this location. And it's just, I suppose, the lesson learned is, you know, there is specialist technology out there, although we paid for it because uh, it has increased cost. I think it's actually in the round, it's saved us an awful lot. Um, then if we move on to the, the last section of the scheme, so Meadow Lane Farm. So this, this site um, is a little bit different because this actually protects uh, properties from the River Dove. In this location and this is well yeah it's pretty straightforward in the sense that we're just upgrading um the flood embankment that's there at the minute because they, we couldn't actually well it's not the right height and also it was red carded by the field team because it's unsafe to maintain because it's uh the embankments are too steep steep for the the mowers and it's too uh close to um water so um the main stakeholders here were farmers and uh, which they were pretty much pretty straightforward apart from um so one of the things we had to consider is one of the farms was actually a center to help young well extreme young offenders in terms of rehabilitation so that that then meant that we had to put in sort of extra safety measures to protect the site team in terms of fencing and keeping the site secure um so that was obviously a something you don't really expect to happen uh, but uh, I suppose it made it more interesting. <laughs> the, um, uh, well, you can talk about opportunities now. You're on mute, Will. Of course, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the opportunities, the, the two main opportunities. The first one was that uh, Staffordshire Wildlife Trust were developing a project as we were developing this called Transforming the Trent Valley. So, that project is basically is a landscape scale project stretching from about Rugeley in Staffordshire down to the River Derwent in Derbyshire. And it's looking at uh, the heritage value of the landscape and trying to uh, reinstate some of the heritage of which biodiversity is a part. So we spoke to them and basically said, if we're doing this project, uh, we, we've got money for environmental enhancements. I think perhaps we can join forces. So the long and short of it is, is that we developed a program of uh, wetland creation and river restoration. So we'd be uh, doing more than we would have been able to do on our own because we can use their money too and they can use our money. So 20 hectares, I think, of uh, wetland scrapes and 0.5 kilometres of uh, river restoration will be delivered. Uh, that would have started last year if it wasn't for COVID, but. Uh, furloughing of staff and such like means that it's delayed but it will still happen and will happen uh, this year and some of it next year so going back to the town centre um I had some artist impressions so the bottom right hand slide is, is in a similar location to uh the leisure centre wall photo we showed you so obviously the the amenity here will be improved because we've done a flood defense with a wider path but the money we've got, uh, the additional money we've got from the local enterprise partnership will help the council deliver that wetland. So the wetland will look something like that with a, the boardwalk in the way. Um, it's an interesting turnaround because the council, it, initially they, they told me they, they wanted to drain the washlands because they're always wet. And I had to explain to them that the washlands are a floodplain and they're supposed to be wet. So I told them best considering working with it. So I managed to turn them around from that sort of uh, viewed to actually maximizing what's already there so that'll be a, a a good finish to the scheme um walls and embankments do a great job but, but that's a bit a sort of visual legacy if you like back to you danny uh, you're on mute again danny sorry <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Yeah, so on the 17th of February uh, last year, Storm Dennis hit Burton, which resulted in us seeing, it was about approximately a one in 20 year flood event um, that impacted the works across the scheme. 
a severe flood warning was issued uh, for the town of Burton and uh, GBV had to deploy and man um, the temporary defences for the area uh, where the existing defences had, had been taken down so we could uh, build the new ones. So if you see in the bottom left hand corner photo, uh, the defences there outside of the water tower, they're, they're all temporary defences that are holding the water back. Um, it did mean it impacted the program. So I think we got a four week delay from that flood event. And then the October flood event, 2019, we also got, we experienced a three week delay as well. Um, however, the event, it was really good in a sense because it actually uh, proved how the defense systems worked. And as opposed to just seeing it on hydraulic models, which, you know, we all, we all trust it was, uh, it's the ultimate test, isn't it, to have, <laughs> to have a real flood. And what it did do is it reassured us that the areas that needed work uh, did need work um, and we were investing the money in the right places. Uh, it did throw up an issue with the A38 that Will's um, and myself will cover in a couple of slides time. But yeah, that was that was February last year. So and that's just a one in 20. So one in 200 year uh, would look. Um, well, a lot deeper, I would say. Than that. Um, so then the next uh, big event that happened was COVID-19. Um, in terms of issues, it didn't really cause too many issues, to be honest. Um, initially, there was lots of problems with um, a few, well, a few problems with the supply chain, but quite quickly that sort of got established and um, you know, construction continued because the site was quite, because it's all outside and there's a lot of space, it lends itself to social distancing rules and obviously the protocols that you have to employ uh, following the Construction Lead Leadership Council's advice. There were some benefits of COVID as well. Um, the main ones being uh, the golf club. So the golf club would have been quite heavily impacted at the time because they, they do uh, wedding functions and uh, some was their busiest time and it's also the time that we were slamming in sheet piles into the ground um, it meant that it dramatically reduced our compensation um, that we would have to pay to them it also meant that there were less people out and about especially in the public round round by the, the library leisure centre and obviously the registry office there so it meant less impact on on the public in that sense um, and then obviously the super crush just sort of came into its own for, for Don Amor. It actually meant that that section was possible, um, which was excellent because there was a sectional completion on that section as well. Um, and then I'll just hand back to Will's going to cover the A38 flooding. So uh, like Danny says, uh, in February the A38 flooded. We knew there was an issue here. This, this is the A38 by the way on this, this section. We knew there was an issue but um, it wasn't well understood, but we were told it was likely groundwater and inadequate drainage. And then last January, myself and a colleague went to speak to the residents who live under this uh, blue patch here. And we went to, to see what they thought. And they basically said that actually the water comes up in the direction of these arrows and spills onto the road. So we thought, okay, well, we need to sort that out then. And then in February, it happened. They flooded, uh, it was featured on ITN News, this section. Um, the, the good news is, is that the modelling showed that in a one in 200 year event, the defences get outflanked. So it shows that in order for us to claim all those OMs, we need to do something about it. And we can with the scheme we've got now. If, if it wasn't for the scheme and the business case we've got now, it, it would stack up far less uh, effectively with the project. So it, it, it might have been that we would struggle to pay for it all. Uh, we're not paying for it all anyway. We've got a highways England involved. So uh, Hopefully we would have gotten enough off them. So, uh, but we haven't actually worked that out. But the bottom line here is we're going to solve this problem, uh, and Harvey's England will put two million in, and we think it be about four million, so two from us, um, and that's going to happen. It's almost like an add-on to the scheme. It's, it's almost like the size of a of a new scheme on its own. Um, but we will hopefully get that delivered this year. Here's the solution. Over to you, Danny. Yeah. So, yeah, so the solution is basically um, 
to raise walls and well sheep pile walls because we do love sheep piles uh, a bit of embankments and also utilizing an existing footpath but because it, it's pretty much uh, bang on the uh, flood defense level that we're looking to achieve um, along the Tatum Hill Brook and what that will do is that will then confine where the River Trent is backing up along the, the Tatum Hill Brook and it will prevent it from overspilling into the Branston Water Park uh, and making that fill up and then um, coming out the northern end. Um, and that will all be, it, it sits in nicely with the business case, so that will all be to the same standard, so we will protect a one in 200 year standard as well. Uh, and then we're just going to cover stakeholders. Yeah, so stakeholders, I've listed them on the next slide, but for this day on this slide, uh, basically got the A38, so we'll tie into that. So we're having to speak to them, they're giving us some money, so we've got those inroads. But there's businesses here, uh, the flood, I think we can help those too. So we've had to engage with them so we understand what the impact of doing the work will be on their operations. So we've, uh, we've had the immediate chat, uh, we understand what they do and what what they need from us. So our contractor will, I don't know, develop the methods uh, to take that into account. But um, there's a good example here, this property here called Greenways, it's a residential property. Uh, went to speak to them because we said we, initially, although the, the red line on the top goes away from the property, actually uh, initially it was going right next to it. So I said, do you want this right next to your house? I appreciate how close it is. And they said, no, they didn't want it. They didn't want the, a, vegeta a vegetative screen removed that protects them from that industrial area. Uh, they're environmentally conscious, so they, they didn't want to see that sort of devastation. And they didn't want how to be a building site. So I said, fine, if you do that, we'll build it as you can see on the screen, but you'll be at slightly increased risk in that your, it's just half the property, which is the garage, will flood in a one in 200 year event, according to our modeling. They said they were happy to live with that. So I'd mitigate it, put property level protection on, and they said, fine. And then I said, okay, I'll go away. And I reported that back to the team, knowing that people change their mind, knowing that like with the golf course, I haven't really gone into detail about them. They've changed their mind on lots of things and, and stakeholders do. You know, it's not every day someone says they're going to build a flood defence on your land. So I left it and I, I phoned them up and said, are you still happy? And they were like, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's still happy. I wrote to them and said, can you can you reply and write into the letter which summarised a meeting we had and they didn't do that. And then I decided I'd go and see them last Saturday uh, just to confirm and they changed their mind. So we went partly down the road of developing this scheme and now the ones the house protected because they'd rather not have the uh, flood risk issue to deal with. It happened, so happens that in his garage, he's got some expensive stuff. I won't go into that, uh, but it's got some expensive stuff. So when you're dealing with stakeholders, you really do have to speak to them early. We're able to accommodate this change now, but if we'd have left, if we'd have left that and just made assumptions, we could have, uh, it would have cost the programme in terms of time and therefore money, and we may not have got it delivered who knows uh so they're the stakeholders so it, it's like like i say a little microcosm so highways england those who flood we've told them they're delighted we, we deal with all these businesses uh place that builds uh, house tiles uh, a, a supplier for toyota a boilers there's a bnb at the top so we've got to think about the works so and making sure that people can access the bnb there's a container pot uh that was flooded that is very interested and very pleased with doing the work. So that's the end of the main presentation. So uh, by way of conclusion, conclusion uh, we, we've delivered everything on the main scheme within cost and time, which uh, it was quite a challenging scheme to do it within that time scale, as Danny said, but we managed to do it. Uh, there were many stakeholders. I'm mindful of glazed over a lot of it. I haven't gone into a lot of the, the detail because uh, I wanted to try and cover all of it. Uh, we engaged early. I can remember going to see the golf club, for example, in May 2017. We didn't start doing any work till October 2019. That's how, how long we engaged with them. So the reason for that was to take them with us on the journey and to uh, take their considerations on board at every stage of the project. So mainly into the design so that we got everything uh, taken into account to avoid any, any disasters later on. Uh, but I think delivering it on time because of uh, partly due to stakeholder management, it's not the only thing. It's enabled those opportunities to be delivered. If we'd have had problems with the main scheme, we may not have been able to do the environmental things because 
they can often get missed off. Um, we may not have been able to take on the A38 works for so soon because uh, we'd be still dealing with the main scheme. And another thing is that both myself and Danny have concluded that we've had quite a stable project team, which has been very helpful uh, in delivering the scheme. And uh, I think we've had one sort of key member leave over the entire uh, sort of four or five year life of the project. So that is the end of the presentation. Hope it wasn't too fast. No, that was really good. And uh, thank you, uh, Will and Danny, for a um, really informative and uh, really, really good presentation on, on, on the uh, Burton scheme. Um, so I've got a number of questions in the QA. Um, so I'll just um, I'll just start from the top, if that's OK, um, and um, try and cover all of them and see how we get on. Um, so first one, um, did you fund a liaison post with uh, MWR? So I'm assuming that's Network Rail. Uh, uh, I think we did agree. No, we just uh, we didn't fund a liaison post. We did have well, we ha you have to have um, we had a, uh, there's a chap from uh, the contractors uh, as, who is a, a CRE they call them in Network Rail. So he was a specialist role, but he was because he'd worked with Network Rail had years of experience in rail. Um, he knew the whole process to go through and it really helped when uh, speaking with their ASPO team and going through the whole process. You know, he understood what the timings were. Uh, you understand who to talk to, who was involved, who needed to be involved, what you needed to think about. And I think that that really helped when talking to Network Rail. I think it would have been hard if we were trying to navigate that process without him there and that specialist knowledge. Okay, great. Um, just seen another one. Um, right, okay. So there's one about stakeholder engagement, but I think you've covered that well, uh, pretty well. So uh, next question. Um, allotments, network rail and a golf course is quite a combination of stakeholders. Were any contributions uh, secured from any of the stakeholders? So not just limited to those, so potentially the brewers as well. In short, no, uh, we went to see Molson Cause about a contribution and it took us quite a while to get in with the right people, uh, but we didn't have the conversation. We basically said, if you give us, I think we were talking about three million to move it up to the, to the next level, uh, but they politely wrote back and said they wouldn't contribute, but that, apparently that's not unlike them. But then I suppose from their point of view, if, if they know we're going to build it and pay for it, I suppose you could say, why, why would they contribute? And that's the thing with contributions. Uh, we've got the contribution from the local enterprise partnership. It is other government money, but we've got that because we we're able to do additional things beyond the flood defence. Okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so, um, bit of a um, long question again about about stakeholders again. Um, how do you think some of the challenges you face with stakeholders because it could have been reduced? Um, so, for example. The residents of the private road, Blackpool's, Blackpool Street, why were they against you using the road for access and how could that be improved? Um, I think with that particular example, um, there's only about 10 houses and there's a guy there who lives there. He, he's basically the local eyes and ears and you're not allowed to do anything without his permission, if you like. Um, I suppose, I don't think they would have ever let us go down their road. Um, but I think we've probably, we've done quite well. I would say that because I've been on the state conference, but we've done quite well in speaking to everyone. But I think in that, in that scenario, I, it's always about uh, doing it early enough and taking them with you. I think the guy there, he, he, he's in charge of the road and we didn't ask him early enough. So he probably took a slight umbrance with that. In the end, it wasn't a massive deal that we went, the long way around, but ironically now he's complaining that we've dug up the park when <laughs> we went the long way around. So it, it's always about early engagement. If I, if there's ever an issue, it's like at Green Street, I mentioned we annoyed someone and we didn't engage him early enough because we didn't think we needed to do much there and then COVID caught us out. But everywhere else, like the golf course, uh, 
that we have had to pay them compensation, but it, it's tiny compared to what we budgeted for because we've yeah. got them on time mainly. Yeah, okay, so it's just that standard that engagement. Yeah, it's, it's simple, but it's so easily overlooked and not done right. Well, I think I think these things come along uh, even if you do the early engagement, but it's, it's the, the, the key lesson is to do that engagement as early as yeah. possible. You can't, you can't do it early enough. I, I did question them doing it too early, and I just thought, no, because yeah. the, the more you find out sooner in a project, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've got a question here about sheet piling for the, the Don Amot section, sheet piling. You mentioned, uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, side and pressed installation. What was the embedment into rock? How was the ground profile and deflection allowance? I don't know if uh, that makes any sense. <laughs> That's a little bit of that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the so the Don Amot, so the sheet piling there, so it was, so it's all good in and then the rest of the pile is then pushed in, um, into bedrock, I think it had to go into, I think it was a couple of metres into the mudstone at the bottom, but basically the, the depth of the sheet pile, uh, there was, it had to get lower than the bed of the river, because at that location we were trying to protect from scour and erosion because it was sort of on the bend of the river uh, and what we didn't want to do was the flood defense was relatively small but you could see where um, the river especially when it gets into high flows was eating away at the footpath or the berm at the bottom of the defense so that the piles are really long to it had to get it was they were eight and a half meters to, to protect basically uh, from uh, scour and erosion. Um, how was the ground profiled and deflection allowance? I won't. I could find the answer out for you and email you the answer if you like. Uh, that's fine. Um, perhaps, perhaps afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so I've got another another sort of um, opportunity here. It looks like there could be an opportunity for runoff filtration from the A38 through the Highways England Environmental Fund. Um, do you know anything about that? Yeah, that's, that's where we're getting the money from. So they've got something called the Environment Designated Fund. So mm -hmm. we're working through their chaps. To, it's in the programme already now. So we've just got to fill the forms in. Yeah, okay. He says. <laughs> okay. What recommendations suggest for engaging with residents effectively during lockdown? Uh, say that again, sorry, James. So what, what recommendations would you suggest for engaging with residents um, effectively during lockdown times? Okay, so for the A38 residents, we, we've held a meeting like this. So I think okay. that it works. I think you've got to show that you're making the effort still. And it, you know, we want to tell them, so it works, doesn't it? And it's not everyone's cup of tea. So uh, we follow it up with by writing to folk as well to so send them a send them a newsletter send them an email uh and do this face-to-face -face online stuff yeah great um so just just another couple i think um we've we have had had experience with high flood walls on public safety grounds i.e people don't feel safe behind them as they can't see behind them do you know how how you've sort of addressed that because i think there's there's been a few sort of high walls on this and public don't necessarily feel that safe. Is it just, just down to engagement with those people behind those flood walls? Is that safety from the perspective that they could fall off them or that they don't like it when the river's up against the wall? I think it's, they don't like it when the river's up against the wall, they probably don't feel safe. Oh, okay. Um, we haven't had, I haven't seen any uh, issues raised by the public about about that. I, I can certainly appreciate why they would would feel like that, but um, I suppose the the way that the flood walls have been designed, they've been designed to take the modes mm. uh, of the of the river, and then they've also been designed so 
uh, they fail in a certain way. If you know, if they were over top, they wouldn't just crumble and just fall over. I mean, most of these have got sheet piles, and then they've got concrete wrapped around them, or they've got some sort of pile system uh, holding them up as a as a uh, effective foundation. So, um, I suppose that would probably be the reassurance I would give to the public if they were to ask. That's great. Um, just going to see if there's any more questions. I think we're more or less getting to the end of them now. Um, um, so, just just from 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 my point of view, um, so the the main lessons learned from from this project um, would be sort of early stakeholder liaison at the, 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 the earliest opportunity, uh, like you say, Will. Um, but what, what's, what's in terms of the cost benefit analysis, do you do you sort of build stakeholder engagement into that um, sort of financial model or would you look to do that in the future? Because it's quite a, um, especially, especially in these built up areas, it's, it's quite a big engagement, you know, it's a bit activity for a uh, resource to undertake. Yeah, it is a large cost. Um, we, did, we didn't build it in, did we, Danny? Is there something uh, that gets done? It gets built in as a cost, doesn't it? So we built in the project, obviously, we employed GBV with the, the project liaison officer. Of course, and yeah. We built in yeah, staff yeah. costs, so... Um, and actually, our, our offices pay for it programme level. It's just mm. my, say, my time and Danny's time. And I suppose, it, yeah, my time... I think it's about... Was it? The way it gets built in as well is in the risk uh, figure and the compensation figure. So this is where it's paid dividends. The compensation figure we estimated at the start of the scheme, you know, it's nowhere near to what we've uh, paid. We've paid a fraction compared to what we allowed for in the budget. The risk register, the risk register, you know, you'll have most of the stakeholders on that risk register and they will have a, a mean value that you'd have to use within your business case. Um, so it would get built in, it's been built in that way into the business case rather than a, a distinct item, I'd say. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, was any, uh, just final question really, I think I've, I've seen quite a few. Um, was any floodplain compensation required to offset where defences were raised above, above existing? Did you have to balance it out anywhere? Uh, no, it was all within tolerance, wasn't it, Danny? Yeah, I think the way that the plan system works in Burton is it's um, it's so wide anyway that they modelled it so that they shifted all the defences. This is a, as a theory. We didn't do this. <laughs> uh, we shifted all, all the defences close to the river by ten metres, and determined what that would do to the uh, flood levels of the river. And it didn't change them. There's, there was no change. Um, so then based on that basis, that's what we uh, applied for in the permit. So if we were to tweak, say, tweak the alignment by a metre, um, it, you would know that it would have no detriment and you wouldn't have to um, provide compensation. OK. OK, well, that's, um, that's really good. And um, thanks again for your presentations. Have you got any last statements that you want to make or anything that you want to... Um, recommend i know you've done it in your presentation already but uh, I think we could mention the the permit so the permit for the scheme uh something we have to approve we we did one so it's, it's lots of different sections but we did one permit and then in effect every time we did a section we just added it to the permit so we didn't have to get the whole thing permitted up front which that would have been a massive risk so we, and we, the best thing to do is uh, for agency people listening, they speak to national and agree the process. And they'll they'll suggest something like that, and then it makes it much easier, doesn't it, Danny? That, yeah. that was a risk to us. Yeah, that was a big risk, really, because uh, it was design and build. Whereas normally you would have the design and then you could get the permit done. Uh, we didn't really have the time or the luxury to do that, so they're quite sort of uh, flexible with their approach to this. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Well, um, just going to hand back to Barbara soon. Um, thanks 
again, Will and Danny, for your um, brilliant uh, presentation and uh, answering the questions uh, put to you. I know there was a lot of questions there. Apologise for that. I was just uh, trying to make them easy for you, but uh, you answered them really, really well. And it's a, it's an excellent scheme that you've presented. So on behalf of me and hopefully all the participants who've, who've joined, um, yeah, thanks again um, uh, for, for an excellent presentation. Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to say, uh, Barbara from Sarum HQ? Well, I'd just like to thank both Jenny and, and Will for the very, very, very interesting and informative talk. And it's quite a complex project, really, when you're having to deal with all sorts of different types of uh, stakeholders and how you overcome, overcome some, overcame some of the issues, and also relating it to COVID. Um, this is really, really very interesting. Um, if we are able to put it up on the website, I've put the details of where you can view all our past recordings and um, also a, a link to um, our events page if you're interested in any other um, webinars that we have. But I'd like to thank the East Midlands and West Midlands branches and Siwem uh, Rivers and Coastal Group, as well as ICE East and West Midlands for organising this event and to our two speakers as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.